welcome to the next episode of the game. So everyone, I'm just going to just do a little quick little thing. I'm so excited. I got my computer back. And so my video probably looks better. My sound probably sounds better. <laughs> we have Russ and we have Tim with us tonight. Hey, welcome, Tim. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Tim, yeah. you've been on the <clears throat> show with us before, right? Like way, way, way back oh. in the day. Way, before way back us. in the day, I, I was before, yeah, us. before yeah. you guys. I was I was on with uh, with the doc. Yeah. yeah. So with doc many, many. and was and with Grom too, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So back so in the day. Do you want so, do you remember that episode at all? Do you want to give everyone like a little teaser into what that episode was? That episode was it was pretty much just an interview of me, actually, just sort of my experiences with with D and D, uh, how long I've been in yeah. the uh, your in nerd the cred sphere, and my, my nerd cred, basically, yeah, where how I started, where I got my inspirations, that sort of stuff, and then okay. just um, ranting about um, uh, probably my my first ever and probably most uh, common, uh, not common, my my most uh, memorable uh D D horror story. So Ooh. <laughs> that was that was where the session ended pretty much. <laughs> so, so there you go, folks. There's a nice little teaser. If you want to know what that horror story was, you should go back and find that episode. Well, oh I'm gonna, man. I'm check that out now because <laughs> I haven't seen that movie, so, uh. I know. It's it's back in the, the annals of history. <laughs> um a year or so ago. The first age of Dungeon Studios. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Well, anyway, folks, for those of you joining us, we are a tabletop talk show. My, I just, I like <laughs> stroked out there. Did you see that? My brain mm -hmm. just stroked out. We're a tabletop talk show. We talk about everything from session zeros to campaign heroes. And today our topic is going to be sci-fi in gaming, how to add like sci-fi elements into your fantasy gaming. If you watched our last episode, we met with Keith Baker. We were talking about the world of... Uh, I almost said Eneron. We weren't talking about Eneron. We were talking about Eberron. <laughs> and, you know, confused. and and that, you know, some folks kind of feel like it has a steampunky vibe. We were talking about the definition of like steampunk versus how you would add, use magic in maybe like more scientific ways. And on the heels of that, I thought it would be really interesting to actually talk more about leaning towards sci-fi and gaming and and how you would do some of that stuff i personally have never actually played like i haven't played in the world of eberron yet i haven't played uh what's the one why can't i think of it the module um in the ship oh expedition to the barrier peaks my 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 field of expertise actually yes. that wasn't the one i was thinking of why no? can't i seem, i'm my brain oh. is 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 I'm going to oh, look it up jammer. now. Spelljammer. Thank you. Spelljammer. I haven't, yeah. Thank you. The one in have, the ship. Yes. In the ship. Um, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't played Spelljammer yet, which I, I it's, imagine. It's not just a module either. It's a game. It's a it's whole. A, yeah. <laughs> it's a whole section. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, That's why so I was. <laughs> the closest I think I have been to anything like this is that in my own world, I add fan Final Fantasy type of feel mm, with like some mm, tech mm. in there but that's like the closest i get so i'm actually really excited to talk about this so do you want to lead us in and tell us a little bit about your thoughts on the subject or this you mentioned this module that you that you uh that you run or that you play well that i, that I have run yes so the the expedition to the the barrier peaks actually one moment i will oh. it's over oh, <laughs> Tethered. Oh. oh, there we go. Oh, so so. The struggle is heavy. real. <laughs> this is the this is the Goodman Games. Um, oh, Goodman Games reprints so, of it. So it has the original as well as their uh, five five E updates. Wow. Um, and I have I've I've run through this um one time as a, as a full five uh, E run through and uh, honestly absolutely. Check this out if you're interested. Really good. Wow, um, that does look pretty heavy. Heavy. What, what, are, the, yeah, you could, what are the general you themes and tones of this? Um, so, you know, what's it about? The, con the concept behind the Expedition of the Barrier Peaks mm. is... Put that down there. Stay. Um, so, um, it's set in the world of Greyhawk. It was actually uh, written by Gary Gygax. So, it's right. one of the, the OG. I used to have the original yeah. Greyhawk box set. Nice. Wow. Nice. Um, so it takes place in the Duchy of Jeff, 
very original name i know um and <laughs> is it spelled the, jeff like j-e-f-f -F? it's with a g yeah g-e-o okay, -E -F -F. -E yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's jeff, the duchy of jeff uh in the duchy of jeff duke jeff his um his kingdom um it keeps on getting attacked um at regular intervals by monsters that no one has ever seen before these creatures don't exist anywhere else in the world of Greyhawk right. and so he has called a whole bunch of adventurers together and sent them on an expedition to the barrier peaks to track down where these monsters are coming from there's obviously a mountain range somewhere exactly it's big big, big, big range exactly okay uh and when the adventurers get there they find this silver door that is open and um as monster encounters and whatnot along the way and when you get inside of this cave you find that the entire thing is metal it's a dungeon but the walls are unlike any walls of any dungeon you've ever seen before it's all uh -huh. iron and there's cobwebs and all sorts of strange things and strange constructs roaming around and uh alien creatures weird mm -hmm. things that you've never seen before and mm -hmm. the mod the module is literally uh five floors of this spaceship um right. that has crashed because what it turns out in, in the end is that the spoiler uh, alert <laughs> spoiler alert of course yes but the the dungeon is um a crashed or a section of a crashed alien spacecraft that right. was um uh, jettisoned from uh the main craft uh due to um again spoilers there was a uh, a viral infection uh that of something that they picked up on a um uh, one of the planets they stopped off along the way or something oh, yeah. they picked up um and the the infection was actually causing um veggie pygmies to burst hmm. out of people's chests. Did you say what, what 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 pygmies? Veggie veg pygmies. Veg pygmies. They're li <laughs> they're little plant creatures that um, currently reside in Chult in uh, okay. the uh, the realms well, of uh, uh, yeah yeah. Forgot they're like the little. They're, they're like um, best to describe them. They can They kind of look like uh, gray aliens, but plants. Probably the best way to describe them. They're, okay. of, they're very short um, things. Yeah. Okay. Um, With pointy bits. Pointy bits, yeah, exactly. And they have they have little dogs called fawnies, which are like fungus dogs. They're they're, they're, they're fungal people, <laughs> um, almost uh, like myconids, but not. Yeah, yeah, not 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 okay. quite myconids. Yeah, this sort of like removed from them. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, okay, I I'm getting uh, the concept now. Yes, and so uh, essentially, you just run through this uh, this ship. Uh, Twenty four hours after you arrive, the door locks behind you and the only way out is through and uh -huh. so you've got to make your way through uh the thing and there's like um the first level that you land on is the uh the passenger compartments right and the place is completely abandoned there's skeletons around the place all you find uh the uh, the veggie pygmies there's an area where there's some doppelgangers around there's displacer beasts around there's phase spiders around um uh, there's maintenance robots, security robots, um, all sorts of stuff. The second floor is sort of the, um, uh, it's actually the, uh, the Arboretum. So it's like a massive interior jungle, um, with, uh, a series of, uh, like cafes and stuff around oh, wow. the top deck. So you can actually look down over the top of there's like binoculars you can view down. Um, wow. there's a lake and then there's a lake in the middle and a little building on top of the lake. Um, and you can actually go into that building and it's uh, an aquarium. So you can actually walk down the interior wow. um, through to the lake, to the lower levels. And then the, the, the decks below that, are the um, storage, but there's also theaters in there. And there's also uh, a gymnasium in there. And there's like a, a boxing robot, a fencing robot and a, uh, a karate robot too. But, and there's but a, is, there, and there's a, is there an armory? Is there an armory? There is an armory that's on the top <laughs> floor. Yes, the first floor, absolutely. Um, if you can crack the if you can crack the armory, there is a uh, there's laser pistols, laser rifles. There's a full set of power armor. Uh, armor. That's there's cool. needle pistols. There's um, uh, gas grenades, explosive grenades. There's all right. sorts of stuff. It's just right. it's great. It's you sound great. very how 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 often have you played through this? You sound like just, very familiar just, with just, it. I've, I've played through it one, but I, I love this module. Okay. The, the <laughs> Expedition to the Barrier Peaks was my transition uh, module. 
So I'd always liked the idea of of D and D, but when I first got into gaming, the thing that got me into it was uh, the the Warhammer universe, oh, sort okay. of gothic gothic right. fantasy. It's very and cool. then yeah, and then when I discovered the expedition to the Barrier Peaks, that was like. Ooh, you can do this in Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Let me do this all the time. Right. <laughs> That's so, so that cool. Was, yeah, so that was the thing that that that, that got me into into D anD D. That was my uh, my eyes watering. Uh, yes, right. Yes, my, my icebreaker, basically. Right. Do you play f- science fiction games that are actually like designed for for, for science fiction as well, or just oddly deep- enough, no, not anymore. I, again, I used to play <laughs> a lot of. Um, I used to play a lot of 40k, but I got out of that um, in in recent years because it just got uh, right. I, I I found I found the community around it was getting a little bit too toxic for for my liking yeah. because the the tournament scene was being run by most of the the same people, and then they would have you know they they change the rules, and it felt like that they were just running events for people that they knew and changing the rules that would benefit them, and then the same people winning all the same events is like mm. oh, whatever. Oh, that's, mm. not good. that's not cool. <laughs> oh dear, yeah. I mean, I've played a few science fiction games. I guess I've played mm-hmm. Star Wars. Um, my favorite one was a game called um, Transhuman Space. Actually, uh, that was so really- what's that like? Well, Transhuman Space is it's a sort of far future sci-fi role-playing game. Um, in the game we played, we woke up as clones and we didn't know who we were or what we were doing, but we were on a spaceship, it turned out. And so we But did you know you were a clone or you don't know you're a clone yet? Uh, at the beginning, we no, we didn't know. We just woke up with no memory. And then I examined my body and discovered that I'm like this short Asian dude. And I'm like <laughs> Okay, so uh, what do I do now? So anyway, that, that was a while ago, so I'm trying to remember exactly what happened, but the overall gist of it was we worked out that we were clones, we took over the spaceship, we ended up crashing it somewhere um, and escaping, um, mm-hmm. and things went from bad to worse. But th- there were things like um, nano, what do you call it, like a, like a nano swarm um, type nanobots. weapons. Stuff like yeah, nanobots, nanotech, nanobots, yeah. And yeah. All that sort of thing, yeah. So all the all the usual tropes all, and at the time that I played it these were like really sci-fi tropes now they're kind mm. of pretty mainstream actually so really? yeah a lot of that stuff I mean you see them in Marvel movies and that type of stuff <laughs> well let's let's talk about this so I mean obviously I, I think <clears throat> sci-fi tropes there's some that people probably like that really come to mind like laser guns and stuff but what are some of these sci-fi tropes that if if like for me, let's say I wasn't familiar with sci-fi, how could I add those elements into my game? What 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 makes it sci-fi? I would say the simplest way to go about trying to add sci-fi is just mysterious devices. That's probably the way that I always um, introduce these these sort of elements. Uh-huh. Um, you always go back to that phrase. Uh, any um sufficiently advanced technology uh is indistinguishable from magic Mm -hmm. yes if you do not understand how it works it works just like magic so (laughs) when you when you describe things to people so um in my most recent game that i ran um they were in uh cholt um i was doing a, a a sort of modified um tomb of annihilation thing so mm-hmm. they they were at uh they were in the country of of cholt uh after the threat of the soulmonger in the tomb of annihilation had been um, completed oh, really? so, oh wow cool. so they they were on their way to the the tomb in order to recover um a piece of the soulmonger that had been destroyed so they had to try and get through the tomb of annihilation that had already already partially been completed so uh-huh. there was some traps that had already been done and so they were dealing with the people that had uh that were in in the process of resetting the tomb after the adventurers had gone right right cool yeah cool. so that's actually yeah. a really cool concept i like that yeah actually, so like they yeah the, 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 it, 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 sorry you go you go the, the subject reminds me a little bit of um currently because i'm running i run vampire the masquerade as but, mm-hmm. Um, you know um <laughs> and a lot of it and the current campaign that i'm running the the chronicle that we're doing at the moment the players are elders 
but they've been asleep for 500 years and they've woken up in modern day Chicago. Mm -hmm. So same deal, guns, cell phones, yeah. airplanes, the internet, all of that shit, they know nothing. And so you're having to describe everything in very basic terms. You're describing every detail of what they, what these objects are. Yeah. And work but you never label them you don't explain them you know mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. always couched in this kind of mysterious kind of you let the players figure out what these things are and yes. oftentimes they they kind of know but they're playing into it as well so mm -hmm. and you kind of need that from your players i think a little bit of buy-in to mm -hmm. this yes. yeah, you know absolutely absolutely they have to buy um, in anyway if they're role playing so it makes sense mm -hmm. yeah. um so I like this. So there's, you know, an air of mystery or magic to items or relics and things like yeah. that. Okay. Exactly. So the way the so you know, just yeah. So back uh, circling back to what I was going. I was going off on a tangent. Sorry. About it too. Oh. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Just, um, <laughs> but one of the one of the side quests is that they had um, they gotten cursed and they were told that there was this cave of wonders. Um, that had all of this uh, mag all of these magic and things that can cure you of any ailment, provided you can um, deal with the the guardians that uh, that live within it. So and if you're so sick and you're going there to get cured, you've also got to fight a guardian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this was a curse, and they had no other choice. Basically, right. this was yeah. they'd been they'd been cursed with uh, the the Rakshasa's um, uh, sleeping. Uh, thing so every time they completed a, a long rest they didn't get the benefits of a long rest mm. which wasn't wasn't helpful for them because they kept on having horrible nightmares so and oh. the the cave was given to them as the the closer option they could travel halfway across the country to get to um uh, port nanzaru in order to find someone to cure them or right. they could attempt to go a little bit into the jungle and find this cave so that was their their choice they decided right. to go for the cave. Yeah. Um, yes. And when they and when they arrive, I described this uh, uh, metal dragon that was breathing fire out the front, and it turned out it was just a uh, a flamethrower on a snake oh. um, aperture. Right. aperture. Right. So that yeah. that was it, describing it to them as a as a, a flamethrower. And then whenever they would come across a like a keyboard with. Um, uh, you know the, the buttons on a keyboard and on a screen you would see you find you find this bizarre looking mirror with a, a pedestal in front of it with different gray runes with different icons on uh. each of the runes. you don't understand what these these runes indicate and he goes i push one of the runes it goes click and you see that rune appear on the screen with a well on the mirror with a flashing yes. green icon and yeah. so yeah they work out okay this is a computer you know but they don't yeah. know that it's a, a computer yeah um so you the the way that you introduce a, a science fiction element into a, a fantasy realm is you describe it in fantasy terms yeah and just, i like that yeah, because uh, because i you know uh adding the final fantasy elements to my game i I go ahead as I'm describing, I just describe it and say, oh, you look at this thing and it looks like a display, like mm -hmm. a computer display. And what so the tip is you need to take that out of your vernacular and then use fantasy terms. Yes. Yes. OK. So like, like say, that. for example, you're, you're describing a um, uh, a mobile phone, mm -hmm. um, similar thing. It's a, a small gray box. It has um, a weird a, 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 a large gem at the top which appears to rotate through a series of uh a series of runes or mm. a series of of letters you're not quite sure but some of these actually look like they might be numbers and down below you see there is a a three by uh, a three by three set of runes with different symbols and a single yeah. rune down below and then one one green and one there. You're basically describing a like a, a Nokia three three fifty. Yeah, you've got to <laughs> you've got to try and find a way to not say it's just a Nokia three three fifty. Right. Just let, but let them's like ah, oh, that's See? a good word. Yeah, that's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be an interesting challenge for me because I use those those things that my players are familiar with 
as mm-hmm. a way to take the burden off myself of having to describe something like that. But basically, I have to reverse engineer that. And yeah. now I, I have to I probably like I can see like, I'll find what the, what they describe the laser pistol as in this because I right. actually really liked that as a. Uh, That's a good shoot. tip already, guys. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you you do something like that too, Russ? Right, that's what you were saying. You're trying to describe. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, I'm currently I'm just scanning through my um, D and D Beyond Dragonlance book because there's similar things in there. Too. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes. You know, you've got, um, for example, there's a thing called a gnome flinger. A gnome mm, flinger. The gnome flinger. Yep, yep, yep. Right. So this is just an example. It's a it's a basically a catapult that's designed to throw gnomes or even larger individuals, fairly long distances, like hundreds of yards. And as they come down, they have a little parachute that opens up. Oh, um, wow. Or, which you hope opens up. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then you Is there a like, roll for that? Yeah. <laughs> roll for <Yeah>. parachute? <laughs> yeah. The whole thing is um, there's, a, there's a whole encounter scenario where this thing comes up near the beginning of the adventure. And, yeah, so it's very gnomish. And then, obviously, we've got Tinker Gnomes. And, and now, of course, with Eberron, we have the Artificer class. Yeah. And that whole yeah. Kind of combination, which brings in a lot of steamy, punky, typey stuffy into Dragonlance, which, mm-hmm. you know, is interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, similar, I guess, to there we go. So, some of the stuff you're talking about. Yeah. So the description for the the laser pistol in Barrier Peaks is, this appears to be a heavy armband with two projections, both about six inches long. One projection ends with a black leather grip, the other ends in a smooth cone-shaped red stone, much like a jewel with a silvery end. Uh, There is a coin-sized slot at the base of this projection. Inside the armband are a number of overlapping plates. The entire thing is encased in a white shell-like material. So that and that's the little the picture you can sort of see. Yeah. Oh right. wow, that's how, that is. So that's how it's described. So so when you when you're describing these things without showing them the picture, you know they might have something completely different in in their in mind. I, I did I, too because I was already thinking, knowing that you were saying laser pistol, I was already imagining like a gun in mm-hmm. my but head actually, and then there's actually the, a wristband the yeah. description do, was throwing me off because i'm like that wait what <laughs> we should do an exercise where we each have to describe <laughs> as, if I, we were, as if we were dming oh man the other players oh yeah. man i found another another a siege weapon a gnomish siege weapon in Dragonlance called the boiler drac um which in the game the way it's designed is that the players assume it's a dragon and mm-hmm. it looks like a dragon and it's covered up and it's it's nighttime and there's smoke coming out of it. And they've never seen any kind of technology, so they don't know what it is. But it turns out to be this siege engine um, that's, you know, creates a 60 foot cone of flame um, requiring dexterity checks and what have you and explosions and all sorts of shit like that. So, yeah, how you bring that into the game as the DM um as the players encounter something like that. Yeah, I totally agree. You've got to keep up that whole mystery and look for really interesting ways to describe stuff that is uh, des- describe around it instead of. Yeah. Describing it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You've got to, got to make sure that you're not. Um, don't be obvious about it. It's probably the best way to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Ev- eventually, like at least at least not in the in the beginning, eventually your players will cotton on to what's going on and you can sort of right. begin using your shorthand. But yeah. another, in the be- another- Right. Another good tactic is to throw in, while you're describing stuff that's weird, throw in a bunch mm. of mundane stuff with that. So yes. there's this kind yeah, of yeah. natural texture and they have to kind of pick out what's weird. Yeah. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. That's a good, I like that too, because you're right. I mean, if as soon as you start using a certain type of terminology, your players are already like tuning in going, wait, okay, so that's a right. thing. It's a magic mm. item, sci-fi right. item thing. Right. Yeah. And there might be sort of mundane stuff that's also from that era or that... <laughs> Although, you know, now I'm might. starting to worry that like if you start doing that with everything like even mundane things your players are going to focus on like it's just a chair right it's just a chair it's not like a torture device like <laughs> uh, you, there is there is actually there is actually um again back to barrier peaks one of the items that um you find that is that most looks like a gun so it's it's this giant thing it has two handles and this big um 
uh, pointed barrel at the end and it has a trigger. So you look at this thing and <coughs> to look at it, you're like, oh yeah, this is this is awesome. This is you know, this is a rifle. It's actually a fire extinguisher. So all oh. it does is shoot um, gouts of smoke. So nice. it's what so it, you can it's mess with like, your players. <laughs> exactly. So when they think about something, it's like, oh yeah, I've got this gun. It's just psh, it just shoots smoke everywhere. So right. works really it. good against plants though. So you can actually use it to kill plants because it's a CO2 launcher. Yeah. So oh, cool. that's great. <laughs> wow. Oh, I love it. Fascinating. So, Okay. Okay. Already a great tip. So what about, um, what other, what other things could you throw into a game to give it more of a sci-fi feel? Um, do you use, I mean, I guess, yeah, like music tracks and all that stuff for immersion. Um, mm -hmm. what about like, do you, that's right. I forget you play online. I was going to say, do you use physical maps and do, how did that, how does that differ? Um, well, yes and no, because again, I didn't always play online. I've now um, gone to using uh, pretty much exclusively tabletop simulator, but back in the day, right. um, I was uh, very much into uh, 3D printing and all that sort of stuff. So much okay. so, actually. One more thing. You can probably see it up there. Wow. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, that's that's actually my, my spell jam. I want to get it down. So. Cool. Oh. Careful. You're tethered. Don't ah, forget. I know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, because to me, obviously, like playing on a spaceship makes sense. Uh, right. You know, in space makes sense. Right. Aliens. But then if you're in a fantasy world, like almost every race is something different. So. But, you know, you think of it like Star Trek, I guess. I yeah. Mean, yeah th the... There's lots of. Wow. Races. That is Look very. At it. Can you bring it any closer to the camera at all? Yeah. <clears throat> There we go. That's awesome. Now that's what so I've got. got. It, so I've got it mounted on a cup so that I can actually sit it over <laughs> oh, the top Oh, that of makes sense. Okay. So it's um, yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, mm. and I've got mm -hmm. th those are actually stuff from uh, the you figures 3D on there. 3D printed that. So the actual thing itself, it's actually the um, the Nautilus from Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Okay. Oh. Wow. All right. Uh, so I, I printed that. The tail fins and whatnot are uh, from a different thing completely, and then I guess cut the top off it. And put an interior deck on the inside. Awesome! Um, wow! And yeah, and the the miniatures that are standing in there are all the miniatures from the uh, from from actual Spelljammer. So they got some space elves, the, uh, right. the flump pirate captain, um, and the actual Spelljamming helm chair. Are they, cool? are they? Do they have space elves, or is that the same thing as astral elves? Astral elves, space elves. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. Just making yes. sure that I've got my noggin straight. Yes, the astral. <laughs> The okay, astral I have elves. to ask because I don't know what astral elves are. What's the difference? I don't really know either, to be honest. So the the astral elves were introduced in uh, the the Light of Zaraxxus or the uh, the uh, the Spelljammer Spell Fifth Edition. Um, mm -hmm. At least uh, fit there. They they were been around for a little while. There there is technically two different types of space elves because the the Shadakai elves um, actually live on the moon. Uh huh. Okay. In uh, in um, in fifth edition, actually, they've always lived, lived on the moon. I thought um, they lived in the shadow in the in the shadow fell. Yeah, no, but they actually they they, they mostly live on the moon though. That's they've actually got a big city on the moon. Oh, okay. I did not know that. That's yeah. that's in Faron. Mm. Yes. Okay, yes. Cool. Um, and so the uh, the astral elves are not nice people. Um, if you when you think of the uh, the drow being the 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 not nice elves the astral yeah. elves sort of leave them in the dust in terms of oh, okay nice. <laughs> right. um do they, they have any different abilities though or they do have some different abilities. something that let sets me, them apart let me quickly look it up they do have glowy eyes Ooh, um, I like glowy eyes but i will look up their their stats because off the top of my head i cannot remember <clears> but the the culture of the astral elves is that they have lived because because when you are in the astral plane you don't age oh really uh yes so okay. um so what when you're you're hanging around in uh in space flying around in your, your spell jammers and things like that you are effectively immortal wow and so the astral elves because they have lived um in the astral plane for basically forever uh they have lived for so long that they have begun to see all other species as lesser right. because you know 
we we live forever. We have all this. Yeah, we we knowledge we've lived longer whatever, than yeah. we we have all this knowledge. We've and we've lived longer than some of these species right. that actually existed. Sort yeah. of like the usual illicit vampire immortal kind of attitude. Mm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it so says, yeah, the basic thing long ago, they ventured from the Feywild to the astral plane to be closer to their gods. Uh, life in the silver void has imbued their souls with a spark of divine light. That light manifests as a starry gleam in the astral elves' eyes. Uh, okay, they have access to uh, one of the cantrips, either Dancing Lights, Astral Flame, uh, sorry, Astral Flame, Sacred Flame, or just the light spell um starlight step here they go as a bonus action they can teleport 30 feet to an unoccupied space they can see you can use this trait equals to your proficiency okay, bonus so kind of like misty step Mist, yeah. kind of like misty step. so they're not yeah. they're not they're overly misty. different to um so it's kind of like they've gotten reflavored but i was wondering if there was anything yeah. like unique to them yeah not not overly friendly. yeah they have they've got uh, uh, proficiency in uh, in, in perception uh they advantage on being charmed they uh oh actually they might actually have a flaw in their thing because oh no i'll say astral trance the same do they have the ability to not be put to sleep but yes they ah. do have that <laughs> that'd suck if they didn't right i know it'd be something it's like yes sleep astral elves go to sleep yeah. <laughs> does that mean they sleep forever <laughs> they sleep forever yes Right, because they because they don't age. Does that suggest mm. that time dilation or something? I yeah, don't, I don't. I don't need to sleep anymore. Right. Um, but the uh, in in the light of uh, Zaraxis, the the one spell jamming module that we we got the um, in fifth edition, the the astral elves in that have essentially been spending most of their existence um committing genocide on other planets by seeding them with these um astral seeds from their home star right. and then these seeds will absorb all the life energy from a planet and then their star through a magical means will absorb um all of the life in order to keep their star burning Okay. And because because they feel they are entitled to it, they live longer than everyone else. These people are all lesser than them, so they have no qualms about uh, just completely wiping out right. entire worlds. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. Have, they have a they orbit a literal death star. <laughs> so here's a thought too. I mean, because seeing as we're talking about um, particularly fantasy and science fiction and that kind mm -hmm. of crossover. Um, we've got Spelljammer in 5th edition. Mm -hmm. We did have an older version of Spelljammer some time ago. I don't know the details because I'd never played Spelljammer. It was it was 2nd edition. That was 2nd yeah. edition? But then, of course, in 3rd edition, we then had that whole branch off to Pathfinder, and then Pathfinder split off into Starfinder. So you've got mm -hmm. the Starfinder version of uh, yeah, Spelljammer. Yeah, that's true. And to be yes, fair, I think true. Starfinder kind of sounds cooler than Spelljammer, in my opinion, but that's mm. just... You mean by the name? or, or... by the name. Okay, just okay. by the name. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I suspect yeah. that the 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 Pathfinder version or Star Star Starfinder is probably really complex and crunchy, um, much like the rest of Pathfinder, I assume. Mm. But um, mm. yeah, I don't know. So because because Star Starfinder is very much it's futuristic sci-fi fantasy, right? It so is, it's a bit different. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's so not, you actually you yeah. you have you it's like full sci-fi fantasy. So is it? okay. It's it's more uh, at, at least from the, the way that the artist it's more it's probably closer to Star Wars. Okay, I, I had the feeling it was more like forty k, but maybe I'm totally wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so big spaceships, big armies, and robots, and mm, mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's it's, it's a fully fledged sci fi universe, whereas Spelljammer is just a way to add space, <laughs> yeah, space traveling and things like that. Right, because what kind of linking the worlds together? Yeah, because cool. in the in the previous versions of of Spelljammer, they had this this concept that all of the different worlds, all the different, um, like so, for example, the um, uh, it was, we were mentioning it before, uh, Dragonlance, Dragonlance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Dragonlance exists in what is known as its own crystal sphere. Yeah. So all of the solar systems or all of the worlds existed within their own crystal spheres, and that was their space. So you had 
yeah, Dragon Lance Space or Lance Space, right. maybe they call it that. Crin Space, it might be. Crin Space, that was it. Crin, yes, thank you. Crin Space, you are correct. Yes. Um, and then you had um Greyhawk was Grey Space. That was their sphere. Um, I don't know what um they ended up calling the one for um for Faerun. I, I think that just became Wild Space. Or... No, no, that was Realm Space. Realm Space, you're wow. correct. Well, there you go. Love you're the all fact over you it. guys have all this lore. <laughs> <laughs> you're all over it, exactly. So the idea was that everyone was sort of anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, you're kicking my ass here. The <laughs> <laughs> the the different spheres were sort of safe, uh, and then once you exited a sphere, there were certain paths that allowed you to travel between the different spheres to get to the different. Uh, the different worlds, but outside of that, you were in um, the, well, even, like, it, why, you were like in wild space, and that was where like the right. um, the elder evils, like Cthulhu and stuff, they live outside of the spheres. Right, the almost spheres are like, kind of like the far realm. Yes, um, yeah, exactly, exactly, very much the same sort of thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, yeah, and then yeah. you've got the what, what's the whole thing with the phlogestum or what is it called? Uh, something like that. This that sounds disgusting, and it's some kind of magical thing liquidy astral oh it's kind of the like the uh, yeah yeah i'm trying to it sounds and disgusting um... and it's liquidy <laughs> just yeah yeah it's, it's, yeah it's like it's like it's like like the, the it's like almost like the weave but it's it's right it's like yeah yeah I can't, I can't, honestly, it's like a flow of of the weave that flows through yeah yeah so you, between you the fall- yeah, yeah. And you you use the you use those to to travel on. It's sort of like the um, yeah. the slips, almost like the slipstreams of right, um, right. Yeah. So to galactic yeah. highways or whatever. Yes. You want. Yeah. 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 All exactly. right. So so I have a, if we're done talking about the space, yeah, yeah, I have yeah. a question. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I want. I mean, it's just fascinating hearing you guys spout all, all, all this lore. But um, thinking about like science fiction elements what i haven't seen a lot of and i don't know if it's because it's something that's really difficult to do is time travel in right. D mm. games have you mm. guys experienced that are there modules about it that i don't know about how have you guys done time travel in your games because i'm very curious about this i love time travel stuff there is one that i i know of um it is actually linked to, um, again, linked to the Barrier Peaks, but the updated version or ish remake version. Uh, for uh, for Extra Life, a little while ago, they released um, two modules. One of them was uh, the Lost Laboratory of Qualish or Qualish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I've um, seen the name. Yes, like he, yeah, he, he's the guy that creates the, created the, the crab tanks. Oh, okay. There's That's, a sort of Kailash too, isn't there? I think maybe I'm wrong. Ooh, it getting... might be a different. It's it's it's, it's K K W A L I S H. Right. The, the, that's the Chult thingy that involves. There's like uh, mechanical objects and like a crab and some other. Yes, things. yeah. The mecha- the mechanical crab exactly. He's the right. guy that invented that. So right. yep. the the module is um a uh, sort I'm... of a revisit or a reimagining of the Barrier Peaks. Like you go to this place that you find this floating monastery, which turns out to be a crashed alien <laughs> spaceship. Um, right. And then you end up, uh, and it also turned out that, uh, that, uh, that Qualish used it as a laboratory until he got kicked out by the, the grand master who right. is uh, not a nice person. And then you've got to find him That's in a different place. Um, but the, the sequel adventure to that is the infernal machine rebuild uh, uh, for the infernal machine of Lum the mad, which okay. is another um, classic um, techno uh, magical uh, device, and there's a, um, there's a lot of techno stuff in Avernus too. Oh um, yeah, very <clears> much <throat> so, very much so. You know, you've, you've even got cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you've got the the flying ships, the cars. Yeah, the motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's full on. Infer- I mean, the, the infernal war machines. Yeah, so right. Do you, it, wait, you know is... Avernus? Amber, Sorry. do you know? Do you, does oh, yeah. do you do you know Avernus at all? Do you know what that is? I mean, well, I haven't. I know what it is, but I haven't right. played in it. Um, um, I this is kind of my goal this year is to start actually playing modules and books and stuff instead of just knowing some of this lore. <laughs> like, I want to yeah. actually experience yes. it. <laughs> but but um, uh, so, did, sorry, did that one have time travel in it? The one you were talking Aver- about? Avernus didn't, but yeah. So yeah. Say, the, sorry. The, the yes. Infer- yeah, you're right. The Infernal Machine of Lum the Mad, that, that adventure does. You basically get picked up by um, 
a, a wizard and you get hired to help him rebuild the infernal machine of, of okay. the mad and you need um components but those components are found in locations that you can only get to in the past they existed right. back in the past they don't exist anymore and so he actually sends you back in time okay um to uh two locations one of them is the tomb of horrors that's under construction <laughs> oh, so, wow. so it's it's the tomb of horrors that's being currently built so it's it's not the whole map but you get to see like certain areas like you like the pit traps aren't covered up there's an right. area probably really smart of the writers because they're like well we can still reuse some of this material in a different absolutely. way yeah. <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah. um and yeah because you need like a gem um which is like a, a control thing and so you've got to you've got to get to the end of it and find the gem smith in there um and they will uh help craft you the gem or you can kill them and steal the gem or whatever okay and the other one is the uh, and, and sorry and the, and the way that it, it uses the time travel elements as well mm -hmm. um is you, you get given the uh the chronometer i think they ended up end up calling it um and it has limited charges and what you can do is you can activate it uh in certain areas on the map and it will show you uh like a hologram of things that have occurred there in the past so there's oh. like a there's like a door that you need to get through but you don't know like there's no way to get the combination or get the password to get through the door but right. if you activate the chronometer in front of the door it'll show you a hologram of a person saying the password yes so you know, you'll know the password but you have limited charges so you've got to be very careful on where you right yeah yeah i mean again in dragon lance there's a sequence in there where you're going through the barrels of the castle um and you're following Lord Soth, who's like the big bad evil mm -hmm. guy mm -hmm. in, the, in that module. <clears throat> you're following him through this chain through the series of chambers. He's already been there and blasted walls open and stuff. And as you're moving <laughs> through this place, there are all these um, I can't remember the term, but it's like blue fire. Um, and basically holograms telling you the life story of Lord Soth. So kind of it's not time yeah. travel, but yeah. yeah. I suspect there's at least one module in first or second edition Dragonlance that goes back in time because there's the whole um, story where Raceland goes back in time to defeat Fistan Dantiles, the master of past, present, and future. And when he gets there, he you know he fights Fistan Dantiles, and his brother follows him back in time as well. So there's this whole sequence. So it sort of seems to me that if you're going to do time travel stuff, a good idea is to separate it by aeons, if possible. Mm, yeah. Mm. So that wow. you don't have too much overlap and, you know, there, the main events that affect. There's actually a, what is it? There's another um, time travel um, event that you can trigger off. It's very difficult to do, but it can be done in um, uh, Icewind Dale. Oh, yeah. Uh, in that that module. Uh, there is the the crashed um, Nethery City. Oh, yeah. Um, under the ice and... There oh. is a uh, a pillar there. It's um well, actually I should say an, an obelisk because they they kind of touched on the the obelisks in the 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 module uh, Fandelver and below the shattered obelisk, right? Because uh, these obelisks That's have been showing up in years. Of, yes, exactly, exactly. But one of these one of these obelisks, if you do a certain uh, thing in front of it, will actually send you back in time to when the city was uh flying still when the nethery society was still existing and that's basically the end of the campaign or the beginning of a new one because you can't get back <laughs> well that's yeah that was kind of my question was like how do how should a dm handle that like i love the idea of being able to send my players back in time to do something but then what if you know butterfly effect they do something stupid and then how do i mitigate that in my head to go when they come back and back to their time um you know that carefully yeah Care it's make scary <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the times i tend to uh there's, there's a great line in um uh, the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy Right. Uh, we say, what happens if you if you go back in time and uh, change the course of history? The yeah. fact is that the course of history doesn't change because it always sorts itself out like a jigsaw puzzle. All the important changes have already happened. Yeah. So, yeah. I like that. So, 
So the idea is that if if they go back in time and they mess something up, they were supposed to mess that up. That was always yeah. supposed to happen. It yeah. already right. did happen, and that they're the reason it happened. They're the reason so, that it happened. I like that. Mm. Okay, cool. So you gotta do. You gotta do that. It's it's that whole. Um, the grandfather paradox. The grandfather paradox, but also the um, it was actually in the the movie The Time Machine as well. Is that why can't you change the past? Yeah. Right? Because if you like, you know, classic example. I want to go back in time and kill Hitler. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I build a time machine. I go back in time. I kill Hitler. Therefore, Hitler was already dead. I didn't need to build a time machine. I didn't build a time machine. I didn't kill Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can't you can't change the past intentionally because. Yeah. There's, if you don't do it, there's no reason for you to do it. If you do do it, there's no reason for you to do it in the first place. It's that whole. Yeah. So the other way, the other way to deal with it is the exact opposite, which is that mm. whatever you do, you know, you you are the present of your own self, basically. So whatever, yes. wherever you are, and whatever you're dealing with is the reality, and everything is just that's what it is. Yeah. And yeah. so you go back in time and you fuck up a bunch of shit, um, and you come back to the future. I wanted mm. to say that back to the future <laughs> um, <clears throat> and you get back to the future and you know, things might be messed up, but you're still who you were and you still remember everything that happened. Um, I guess that would be the other way to go. Yeah. yeah that's the, uh, that's, that's the flashpoint paradox. Right. Wow. Wow. Yes. Deep sci-fi <laughs> stuff coming out here. I just, this is I mean, great though. And, and a third option, a third option, third option. Well, here we go. Parallel universes. Yes. That, yes. Like, that's yeah. Split. You know, it's mm. the simplest, actually, in some ways. So then which the... universe do they go back to? I guess then maybe that's the choice. Ooh, that's fun. You run mm. your players mm. through the past and then they have to choose which universe they want to go back to. Wow. It's your, it's your, it's your back to the future too. Right. Yeah. Where... yeah. There's, there's probably <laughs> a lot of inspiration in um, the latest couple of seasons of Loki too, I suspect. Mm. Yeah. Oh, very much so with the whole, right. uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was, that's what the whole the whole series was all about that, that whole just, exactly yeah. There's a lot of food for thought there mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but yeah mm -hmm. time travel is a bloody hard thing to do in, in a role-playing game I yeah mean, yeah i yeah. do a lot of flashbacks and that's hard enough because you've got the whole stipulation that this you, you must not die yeah. there are certain things that can't happen because it's a flashback so everybody has to kind of work together to play through those scenarios in that way and again, you could do that with with time travel. I think you, as long as you know the players need to cooperate a little bit, knowing that certain events must happen, whether that's in character or not, I don't know. Um, yeah, whether... that's a good question. Yeah, if you if they go back in time, yeah, now we're back to that paradox, and they die while they're back in time, then they would never have been in the present unless you mm. use one of those. Oh, I, man, think, I think I think the best thing about <laughs> doing time travel would be to just keep it ambiguous the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Never tell them the rules. Yeah. There's yeah. The, don't tell them the, how it works. The the most recent <clears throat> um uh, big box that came out was the the Planescape box set. Yeah. Right. Um and that actually has another really uh interesting uh element to it. Um because I mean just just you know just in a general sense, one of the one of the things about about D and D is that it kind of already is a sci fi setting yeah. itself because because it has spell jammer and it has all those things in it but it also has uh, your mechanical constructs built into it primarily yeah. the the modrons but also Mechanist. the mind uh, also the mind flares and the gif I mean they're they're space people yeah I mean the uh, they're the, creepy the mind alien like. And, <laughs> Well, you know, the, the mind flayers are aliens. They come from space. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There's no, there's no two ways about it. That's that's where they come from. The um, Yankee were their slaves, weren't they? Exactly. Yeah. The <clears throat> quick, quick, quick summary. The um, uh, in in the law, way, 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 way back, um, the Gith were actually humans. Um, the the Illithids kidnapped them and then genetically modified them to be better slaves. Mm. Um, which is why they look so different and then they because they were in proximity to the um uh, the illithids for so long they developed uh telepathic abilities and then um uh, gith the the first the actual first uh person called gith developed yeah. a way to block their um uh their psionic control rebellion happened and because the uh the mind flayers were uh, 
so confident in the fact that none of their slaves could ever possibly uh, overthrow Revolt them. against them, yeah. Exactly. Sure. They, they weren't prepared for <laughs> it and they got the shit kicked out of them and their, their empire collapsed. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, is- I, so I'm trying to figure out how to ask Ooh. this question because when I created, I, I'm, I run a homebrew world. So when I created mm-hmm. my campaign, I already had some of these like Final Fantasy-esque things in my game but i Mm -hmm. learned very quickly one of my players she kind of made an offhand comment she wasn't talking about my world but i remember she said something about how she was very disappointed in this one final fantasy game because it was so it had way too many sci-fi elements and that's not what she was here for and Mm -hmm. so as soon as i heard that i went okay Mm. i have to make (laughs) sure that i don't introduce any more than i have already introduced because mm. now she'll be playing in a, in a very different world than she was expecting. Right. Do you agree with that? That like, if you've already established this world, you don't want to introduce your players to extra, you don't want to add extra stuff unless you're, unless I, I will, like, you get the okay I, I will from say, them or something. Yeah, I, I will say, because in my my first ever game, um, I, um, I threw everything at them because there was so much stuff that I had wanted to do so when i when i ran my first game we ran them through curse of strad um initially uh and then we sort of did other bits and pieces that that i had and we ended up doing um a small section of barrier peaks one of my players just checked out yeah because they just were not interested at all just they weren't engaged (laughs) weren't engaged at all and they actually stopped coming for the weeks that we did that part of it and then they came back afterwards they were just well it's good they came back then (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were just, they were just not interested at all in that bit, which was disappointing. But you know, yeah, I mean, I I have to admit my own personal um, tastes and what have you. I'm not a person that wants to play a, a fantasy game laden with science fiction elements. I would want I do want to play a science mm. fiction game laden with science fiction elements. But if I'm going to fantasy, for me personally, fantasy is about. Um, pre-technology type mm. stuff it's it's yeah, all about yeah. that because it's it focuses on the idea that magic has that role um, yes. yes and it's much it's archetypal in that sense and when once you start bringing in um technology technological elements they, it starts to get more and more reminiscent of the real world and mm. i'm here to escape from the real world <laughs> yeah yeah i don't yeah. fucking want to know about the real world so i can see that, that. Yeah. From, you know? that being said if you said I want to run a, a fantasy game with technology in it, and I had a time, a moment to get my head around that. I would be into it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Have to know what my expectations are, and I think if you set the right expectations at the beginning, even if you say, um, for example, you don't know who your characters are and you don't know where you are, that's going to be the campaign. Do you accept these conditions? You know, mm-hmm. and if they accept those conditions, well, it's all on them, you know. But if you, if so, you know, if you say you're running a fantasy game and it turns into science fiction, well. Yeah. 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 You... I didn't, yes, like I didn't sign up for this. But, I um, feel like probably... I kind of liken this to like, I don't know, fantasy is the green olive and sci fi is blue cheese. And there are <laughs> olives with blue cheese, but right. you have to have the palate to want that or right. want this or want this. Either way, yeah. they're all different flavors. Or maybe there's yeah, another right. analogy you can use there, but your yeah, players need sense. to have. Yeah, yeah. They they have a flavor expectation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my problem was... is I like hard sci fi, um, mm. and so most of the sci fi that ends up in fantasy is really soft sci fi, and I'm just like, well, why don't we just have magic because it does the same thing? Yeah, yeah. there um, is actually um, a, a good world that actually does a, a good blend of um, sci fi and magic is Shadowrun, right? Oh yeah, yeah. okay. Because that's that's cyberpunk with yeah. magic, right. um, in in fantasy because the um. I know a little bit about Shadowrun. I'm not. I'm not mm. not expert at all. But the the basic premise of Shadowrun is that there was an event. I believe it was called the Divergence or something like that. Um, and what happened was that um, human beings began to evolve in different ways. In and the ways that they began to evolve turned them into elves and orcs and other type species uh and then we're in the future you've got your corporations your basic cyberpunk sci-fi type thing but so you've got um your your fantasy and your your science fiction um right. cyberpunk yeah. existing um, quite uh, naturally right. but also a lot of the um uh the a lot of the corporations are run by dragons 
right? Uh, because the the dragons have existed <laughs> forever, you know, because they can look like however they want want That's to look. That's true. So I forgot about that. Like, yep. They look like people. So a lot of the heads of the corporations are actually dragons. So they're, they're the ones um, sending the people to hire you to, you know, to screw over another dragon and things like that. So that's the... Have you ever played Palladium? Or have you heard of Palladium? Oh, jeez. It's ringing a bell. So back in the old days when D&D was still, you know, first edition, <clears throat> they used to publish the, you know, Dragon Magazine and what have you. <clears throat> this guy called Kevin C. Beta started producing um modules for D D and mm -hmm. tsr sued them and they went well fuck you we'll just write our own game so they went off oh and right no actually i, I never have no that's yeah. the thing you something completely different yeah okay it's very similar to to D, &D in many ways mm -hmm. there's a few mm -hmm. key differences a lot more classes you can you can do things like parry but they have there's the palladium fantasy game then there's rifts which is set in the real world in the future i do, I do know rifts yes right after the rifts open and then fantasy creatures from all over the universe start appearing on earth mm, and the mm, earthlings mm. us humans build the coalition who are like a super high techno author autocratic um kind of evil society um very science fiction and it's actually i think probably now that i think about it the most sci-fi fantasy crossover you can really get that i've seen mm. um oh, i was gonna say the just, just circling back a little bit um because we were we were talking about the um, uh, alternate universes and mm -hmm. things like that, what to do with, right. with your players. <clears throat> uh, what I was going to say is the most recent big book, uh, the uh, Planescape. Uh -huh. The key um, mechanic in that particular adventure is based on um, a fracture in the multiverse. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that it, it works is that there's been a, a multiversal glitch. Uh, and so at the beginning of the campaign, you actually get your players to make three versions of their character. Oh, wow. All right. So you, you get them to build, build their character, but have <clears throat> something that links them together. Like maybe one version of them is a satyr, one version of them is a, a minotaur, and one version of them is... A so wait, the person yeah. creating the character knows they're, they're creating... Three, three versions. versions okay yes okay, you, you yeah. make you make them you get them to make three versions of them okay. or yeah you, know, you can keep it secret but that's you know for this to work smoothly they right. kind of have to get had to get the basic idea of what's going on um and what happens is that every time they die they come back as a different version of themselves okay interesting so, so in kind this of pulling module, it's pulling their soul from like another universe yeah. the, the, okay. the idea is that something happened to them and they got fractured across the multiverse so now whenever one of them uh ceases to be another version pops in from a different reality to take the place i so like the that the continuity is is uh preserved i like so that for, especially if you have players who like i know i have a few players who are very nervous about dying because they are just so invested mm. in their character and this is a good way for them to still feel like they have their character but it's yeah. also different and there's still the consequence of dying yes Come on. Oh. <laughs> yeah so it, that's that's actually the thing is this, this module um the, the players are effectively immortal because because even if they've burnt through all three you just cycle yeah. back to one of the one of the ones it's just a version right. that yeah. looks like the original version but you know it didn't make that mistake that got them killed yeah um, yeah initially so yeah and uh the way the adventure goes is that um they go all the way up to level 10 i think and then the final um the final section of it you actually jump them to level 17 wow oh wow uh, so you they, they get to pick one version which they want to be the prime version of themselves uh -huh. and then you level that version up to 17 and then you go to the final level and that is the point that they can actually die and fail that's right. so that's how that sounds so difficult though. Well, I guess it depends on how long someone's been playing, but I know like my newbie players mm. would be like, I have a million new abilities oh, and I don't know how to use them. <laughs> yeah. You want to be a little bit experienced. Mm. Wow. Mean, I mean, you could manage, I'm sure, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's... I was going to tell everyone for, for anyone who's thinking about, talk to your players, but if you're thinking about adding like sci-fi elements to your game, I was going to suggest like looking at the, any sci-fi media that you like to take in movies books and things and mm -hmm. what makes that science fiction like mary shelley's frankenstein you know what makes that 
sci-fi is that there's someone creating life from death and there's you know yes. some technology involved and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so you could do something like that there could be the hunger games well, I mean, science fiction like t traditionally in in terms of um literature science fiction has always been the thing that's asking questions mm. yeah mm. it's the thing that makes us conscious of the ethical and other considerations of what we're doing you know and, and the changes that we're making and uh, you know in mary shelley's time it was a it was a question of life and death are we playing with um you know are we playing god yeah. So that's if you, that was if you, the thing. if you zap someone back to life, are you playing God? That's this, yeah, yeah. The pad, yeah. like the pad, the paddles. That's you know, you see them in, in the movies. Yeah, All right. You show that to Mary Shelley, it's like, oh, <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> oh, you look like that meme cat. Like, <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> everybody screenshot that. That was only for you, <laughs> but uh. Uh, yeah, I mean, this this is how I usually, if I'm struggling with ideas, I go straight to the the things that I take in, movies and books. And I, but I do love the fact that Russell, you take it further, and it's like, what really was that about? Where did where did yeah. that originate from? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, the, at the, I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, for, for me personally, I come from a writing background and a script, sort of film background, so I'm always thinking about themes and you know, plot, theme, and character. Those are the, the those are the three kind of keys to. Um, narrative and the theme is an examination of a central question so what is the examination what's the question that you're asking when you include sci-fi in your fantasy like why are you doing it you're just doing it because it's fun because you like the aesthetics that's fine you mm -hmm. know yeah. but at least you know the answer mm -hmm. so what's doing... a, what's the question for hunger games is it <clears throat> what what happens when you separate society societies by region or like it, there's it goes deeper than that for sure there's more questions i just yeah. yeah i mean hunger games is about power structures it's about <laughs> um you know how how an authoritarian government or system um reinforces itself over time and how yeah. all, all the tropes that we've seen you know to do with capitalism and such yeah yeah it's it. I mean, the, the Hunger Games is like, like I say, it's, it's very much just how mm -hmm. how do people that are in power with ultimate power stay mm -hmm. in power? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's that. It's that. It's also yeah. That quest. That that statement. Yeah. Absolute power will cor corrupt absolutely. That's that you know? whole thing. They and have. Then if if you're like me, folks, and you just struggle to to come up with the actual words to describe what you think about, you know, the theme of the movie, you can always go to the Google and just mm. say, like, what are the themes in such and such? And, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, I, I just yeah. I just did a little bit of a search there. And what are the ethical and moral moral consequences of a society structured around inequality, oppression and the spectacle of violence? Mm. That's, so that's a big part of it, right? The spectacle of violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, you, know, um... <laughs> you start with those thoughts in your mind. If you've got a question like that in mind when you start writing your campaign, everything points to that question. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. You know, and now you've got a really strong story with pathos behind it and it's not... Yeah. You know, you can just wander through the story if you like, you know, and most people do that. But I want some themes and questions and stuff, personally. Well, uh, yeah, it, was, it, was, it reminds me a lot of actually um, the uh, the original Death Race, Death Race 2000. <laughs> it's very, yeah. That, that, that movie is, uh, that movie and... Um, uh, I was thinking what, of the one. What's the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Where that's exactly what I was thinking of. The Running, it, the running Man. The Running that's Man. What it was. Yeah, that yeah, was a yeah, good yeah. book. Death, the Running Man. Death Race. Death yeah. Race and Running Man. Very much. Uh, very much the same. Same style. Very much yeah. the same question. Very much. Have, have either of you read The Running Man? The I book? read it. I read it. It was a good I have book. Not read it. No. Right. It it's like a so hundred pages long, isn't it? It's super it's, short. Super mm. short and so, so condensed and yeah, guys, read it, <laughs> folks. Really, really different to the books. So, sorry, to the movie, isn't it? It's like it's yeah, vastly different. But yeah, it's it's actually a bit like um, what was it uh, Starship Troopers, right? Yeah, yeah. Starship That's, Troopers. That... I heard the book was so different. I didn't read that one. Oh yeah, the book is very different. <laughs> right. I mean, I wow. thought Rob Hoven did a really good job of. Oh yeah, the I I I love the Starship Troopers. Mm. Is the 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 only thing that annoyed me was the um when they when they made the third movie that the end of the third movie bugged the hell out of me. 
<laughs> oh man, I couldn't even. I, once there was, I don't think I've seen the second and third one. I was gonna say, yeah. yeah. Once I saw there was a second and third, I went, oh, they can't be that good, can they? And I didn't watch them. Are they worth watching? The, um, I, I I would rec I would recommend the second the second and third. The second one is very much a low budget direct to you know video direct, direct to video uh mm. movie but it's it's good it's um mm. the story that it's uh, the 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 story and the question that that movie asked is uh basically the creation of a martyr in a particular right. situation so they it's a bunch of people they're, they're trapped in a small a small building um they they come across a new type of bug um they're all getting killed off and then there's this one person that they find that was left behind with you know he was sealed behind in a, in a room with the word um uh, traitor mm. written on the on the um Ooh. on the door and the idea is that you know he ends up becoming the uh you know the hero and they say it, you know it's what the the propaganda of this particular person becomes uh mm. versus the actual story yeah. behind so that's sort of that's sort of what happens in in the the second movie right uh the third movie is um them bringing religion um as a uh as a, as a means to uh to control and enforce their their rule because the whole the whole society within uh starship troopers um is that you have uh civilians and citizens a right. citizen has the right to to vote and because they have put their life on the line to protect their society but um as time is going on with the war they're finding that people are less inclined to <clears throat> follow uh the um uh, to the join up not, uh, yeah, what's the word looking for? not the law the um what's the propaganda the rhetoric the rhetoric, thank you. They're no, they're no longer buying into the rhetoric, but they do find that people are actually turning to religion, and so they, like the uh -huh. commercial is, um, yeah, nine out of ten agree uh, agree to this. God is on our side, <laughs> and so <laughs> right. now, and so you know, they, now they're using God to to um, justify people, this, justify mm -hmm. what they're doing. Exactly, you know, God, right. yeah, God isn't a blood. Yeah, God is a human, and he's on our side. Right. Yeah. He's not, and God wants us to kill the bugs, and so. I'd love That's... to get your opinion on my evil video. Oh. <laughs> it's all about that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But but the thing the I... thing that the thing that ruined the movie for me because I was I was on board until it got to the very very end where they finally get these giant mech suits. You're like, yes, mech suits. They're gonna blow the crap out of the bugs. Mech then... suits are sci-fi for sure. And right. then they get this they get this awesome battle sequence going on, and the entire thing is overlaid like it's like half and half um with t the two um female characters in it praying the owl the owl father over them killing so it's like ah oh, you, <laughs> you killed it <laughs> wow. wow i watched um speaking of the, this type of stuff i i was I, I showed my wife um never ending story a couple of months oh back. yes 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 yes. so that was amazing and of course she loved it and then yesterday we sat down and watched never ending story two and three mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow um, she really liked the second one and i really liked the second one too it wasn't bad um mm. and it very much tied into the first one the third one however was a yeah. pile of trash like yes, what it was not good i can't yeah. remember if i i feel like i've seen the third one but i i don't remember it it's relevant mm. today to this conversation because mm. Mm. it completely rewired the lore of the story oh. it added a whole bunch of science fiction elements that were mm. not in the first one not in the second one you know we've been set up with this expectation yeah. And then they put all the science the fiction stuff in there and technology and things. And then they make all these external references, like sort of um, self-reflexive references mm. to mm. society in modern time. And that just totally destroys any verisimilitude that you've got for being in the story. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that's where people are probably coming from, like, you know, when they have issues with science fiction stuff and their fantasy. So yeah. I suppose that's a, a good example. If you if you want to see just how bad it can get, never ending story three. Yeah. <laughs> I will I, I will say though, the the one the one thing in the, the never ending story three that you that I would borrow for an adventure is actually the 
the ability to rewrite someone's story with the book. Yeah, right. that's I cool. do I like that. Cool. I mean, that, that was that one could... of the parts of the law that was in the, you know, the whole thread that stayed consistent. Hmm. One of the yeah. few. So, like, if imagine if, like, because I think they they, they kind of did that in um, the uh, the Arrowverse, because there was a um, a book that if you had the book, you could rewrite reality however you wanted wow. to. Um, and Lex Luthor had it at one point. He was going through and you know destroying all the different Supermans and all the different universes. And uh, then this one, and this one person got a hold of the the book, and then they made themselves Superman, um, but they weren't a good Superman. Um, Did you do? Yeah. So they were they were like the uh, the injustice Superman when they when they got a hold of the book. But um, I think you could you could actually do um, a, a pretty interesting storyline saying that that. There, like you know, say like somewhere in the multiverse, there is a book that is the book of the way that the world should be. And if someone gets a hold of this book, they can rewrite reality any way that they want. And that could be a way that you could say that the reason these sci-fi elements are jumping in because, say, the the evil wizard Tim got a hold of the book and said, "I don't like this shit. Put some more sci-fi in it." <laughs> <laughs> But so yeah, don't, you, don't you, these lasers more lasers <laughs> what we need is lasers <laughs> so uh, my brain was just bleeding while you were talking about this book because in my game so i think i might have talked about this before but my son uh plays in my game and mm -hmm. he learned that he has been alive much much longer than he ever thought there's this whole mm -hmm. backstory which i'm not going to get into because it's a long thing but they basically at one point traveled to this deity's realm and this deity is all about like capturing everyone's lives in books. Mm. And mm. at the time, I mean, literally this, this library is, it goes on for eternity because it's everyone's lives. And right. if, if someone's still living and you open the book, then the end is not there yet because they haven't yes. died yet. Right. And I, I hadn't thought about it in the moment, but my son goes, I wonder if I can find my book. And I went, <laughs> oh, crap. And his book would be huge because he's over a thousand years old and he's not dead yet. And so mm -hmm. he went and found his book and I let him take it. But I told him, I said, this book represents your life. Mm -hmm. And if this book gets destroyed, you will not just die. You will never have existed. Have existed. You understand that, right? Wow. And he took the book with him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've been waiting <laughs> to see what he does with this thing. But you know what I didn't think about is he could write in the book. He mm -hmm. hasn't tried it yet. I'm talking <laughs> quietly because I don't want him to hear me. But <laughs> oh my gosh, that just broke my brain. And I hope he doesn't think about it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's I just, hilarious. I just actually, I, I just remembered something. Um, because your your the thing about writing in the book reminded me of a Twilight Zone episode. Because there was a a Twilight Zone episode in the eighties where this woman gets hired as a librarian, um, and it's a librarian of people's lives, and so she mm -hmm. starts rewriting the lives of the people around her because they they keep annoying her, and so she keeps on <laughs> trying to give them what they want so they won't annoy her, and she keeps ruining um everything because all she wants is peace and quiet so she can write her own book but they yes. keep on bugging the crap out of her but oh, that's uh, and then that and then that reminded me of another story about a, a woman who found a pendant that allowed her allowed her to pause time so that she could have peace and quiet yeah um and then um she pauses time one last time and it's uh the second before a nuclear bomb blows up right on top of her house so she can never unpause it because otherwise all of her family, <laughs> no. friends and everyone will die <laughs> um but what that what that again reminded me of cycling back <laughs> through my train of thought yeah. um a friend of mine actually ran a ooh okay um a friend of mine actually <clears throat> ran a a game that was in a time loop I was just gonna okay, I have I've an idea that. too, I've but you that. tell me I've your thing that. and then I have a question. Go ahead. So the way the way his adventure was structured was it was the the last week of a graduation at like a, a magic school. Right. And so the the first session was like the first week they're all going through, and then they get to the graduation and the big bad shows up and kills everybody. Oh nice. And so and, th and then they wake up and it's the first day. Wow. That they have all the memories of what happened yeah. and so they've got to keep going through they've, it's it's kind of like um uh like Majora's Groundhog Mask. Day. Oh, okay. Groundhog Day, but, but also the legend of zelda majora's mask yeah right. in that 
he I can, did this on a pirate ship. Mm, so they they That's can cool. they they can go off and do other things in order to prepare to and, ha- and have the knowledge but at the end of the seven days the bad guy will show up and if they're not prepared it will kill them and they're going to go back to the beginning and so it's them trying to find out different ways to uh to defeat this bad guy and there's only certain things they can carry over from from loop to loop right? wow so, mm. that's yeah awesome I- <laughs> do a similar thing on a ship actually now that we're talking about time travel and i'm like how did i forget this yeah. um, because it's very similar to what you're talking about the the crew were on an island um having been abandoned by their captain and what have you they've been marooned mm-hmm. on an island yes. Yes, um, and then this weird mysterious ship turns up out of the mist and they climb aboard to discover that it's abandoned and then these ghosts start playing out this um this drama and basically the players have to figure out what the drama is before the ghosts all start attacking them. And they, this resets every 10 minutes. So, you know, I've got my little glass timer (laughs) so that they, you know, and it's great. They, they finally kind of figured it out. And in the end, they beat the adventure. They got back to the Island. They found the treasure and then they fought each other over it and they all died. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I have a quick question and then I know we're pretty much at the hour. So, uh, what if you could run a game where I, you mentioned the the woman who had to pause time because this bomb is above her house and she can never mm-hmm. unpause time. So what if you started a game or a campaign where you're at that moment and the players have to figure out how they can fix everything to unpause time, but it's got to be a much bigger event. Like this is the world ending event mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. time is paused and they're the only ones that are unpaused, but how would that play out? Cause you couldn't have any NPCs that they could talk to. Unless somehow there were NPCs random, like just a couple sprinkled throughout have, the world that aren't paused. You could have trans-dimensional reason. antagonists of some description. Yeah. Uh, you know, things you like could even you it's could nice. even have, have a thing where you where the the players whatever means pause them, they can they can pull people into their their time stream. Okay. Yeah. So like for so for example, if but I But then if they I have to up, like put them back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So, like, like, so it could be even that, um, like Loki. provided, provided you're holding their hand, um, they they will unpause the moment you let them go, they freeze, right? Okay, yeah, something like that. So that that'd be a way you could you could do it. So you can you could talk to a shopkeeper for a while, but why would you bother? You just steal all their shit, uh, right? <laughs> Well, see, yeah, that, no, I, I, hmm, yeah, I'd have to think about this because then, yeah, well, you, I guess it wouldn't be any fun if all you could do is just loot the world. Then mm, eventually mm. that wouldn't be any fun. So they wouldn't after a while, maybe. I don't so know. The way you, you could almost do it is time is frozen within a, a bubble. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm... So like like have a have a have a specific city, like, say, for example, like there's there's a, a massive explosion about to consume a city but everything outside the city is, is not frozen it's yeah. not frozen there yet. we go so like the like the players arrive and they see it happening you're like no nah! and then someone casts the time stop spell uh-huh. like the wizard does that so they've got to find a way to yeah i'm, I'm intending with my overall with my scenario campaign the Vangate chronicles um that the that there is this rock coming mm. a, a comet called Parkard, and it's going to destroy the world for the second time. Complicated, I know. Um, in any <laughs> case, the players are eventually going to try and stop this comet following some prophecies and what have you, but my plan is to take them out of the world while the world freezes. Mm. So okay. the world freezes and they go into an inter, inter, interdimensional dungeon, essentially. That's that's how I'm going to approach this. And then once they go through there, they'll end up in various planes of other other planes and then they'll come back and hopefully they will have enough um, resources to fix their problem. I'm trying to be vague because I don't want them listening to this. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, yeah. you're going to give it away. <laughs> yeah. But- one thing, just again, going back to, to Planescape with the, the Modrons and, and Mechanists, when it, whenever you're messing with time, you should always have those guys show up because they don't like when people mess with time. Yeah, right. they, that's true. Because yeah. the, whole, the, whole, the whole point of, of the Modrons is to make sure that um, order is maintained. And so if people start messing around with that kind of stuff, then right. the Modrons are going to notice and say, hey, get out, get out of here. And they, <laughs> they, show, they show up with their clipboards and start, making sure that <laughs> you don't fuck this sure, up <laughs> yes making sure things are the running running along and then you get to it isn't necessarily a, a modron enemy but it, 
it is um mm-hmm. the um my favorite uh well probably one of my favorite uh D D monsters the marut which is the um the inevitable um okay. it's a, a it's a giant modron um that is essentially designed to keep contracts oh yeah uh, uh, so if 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 you want to make sure that a contract is upheld right. um and you don't and not necessarily like a devil's contract but just a regular contract you can um get it um adjudicated in the city of Sigil um right. in Planescape um with um uh with a marut and if the the wording of the the contract is uh broken then the marut show up and haul you back to the um uh, the uh, the courts to to be judged, but the thing about um, Maruts is that when they attack you, they don't miss; they just hit you. Nice. Damn. <laughs> they they have a they have a thing called unerring strike, which is so good when you want to just really put the fear of God into your <laughs> your nice. players. Right. I like it. So, yeah, All it, right. just, it just shows up and wails on them. Nice. All right, folks. Well, hopefully you got uh, all the sci-fi that you need to add into your <laughs> games. I'm sure there's plenty, plenty right. more, but that's what the internet is for. Um, mm-hmm. One mm-hmm. thing we learned from Keith Baker, don't call uh, Warforged robots un- mm-hmm. unless you actually intend for them to be robots but um, or intend to break his world. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if you, if you want, and if you want a, a an actual robot, um, Spelljammer, there are autonomes. And they okay. are actual. They are actual robots. They are um, constructs built by gnomes, and basically serve the same purpose as a a warforge. But they are actual robots. So if you want an actual robot, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> All right, folks, we're gonna end on that note. So we will see you hopefully next week. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Tim, for joining us tonight to dig into this topic. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Uh, it's very different from stuff that we've normally talked about. So I really enjoyed it. No, All right. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. Yes. Yep. Yes. You have a great day. Yep. Mm-hmm. Everybody. So it's a fun day. Nope. 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 It's gone, guys. I should have had mm-hmm. it memorized, but it's gone. So we're just going to end on this note. <laughs> Right. Okay. We're wrapping. See We're you guys. Later. It. <laughs> Bye. Same Bye. bat channel. Same bat time. <laughs>